But trust him in God because he has greater things happening for you. Amen? At this time, we're going to offer up a praise in the giving of our tithes and our offerings and the love gift of God in our personal lives from our wealth. What God has blessed us with, we're giving a portion back to him. Amen? Amen. Lord, we be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with faith near thee. you, God, you bless ten times fold and even more. We ask, Father God, now that you bless this offering in a portion, whether it's small or great, Father God, it is great in your sight, for we have given of our heart, God. We've given of our heart and our attitude, and we're giving back to you, Father God, just a portion, because we've never asked what you've given unto us, but a portion of our life, Father God, we give back to you. A portion of our, our, our provision, Father God, we give back to you. We ask that you bless it, that further your kingdom, Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, we give thanks. Amen. 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 It's been a busy week. <laughs> and God is in the week, right? Every day. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for being in every day. <laughs> well, you have your Bibles with you today. I'm going to lead us in the scripture. Our lead scripture is taken from Psalm chapter 9, verses 15 through 17. Psalm 9, 15 through 17. And as you're turning your Bibles to that, some of you, I've marked your Bibles for you. <laughs> a couple of my friends at work were having a conversation within hearing distance for me, and eventually asked for my take about hell. And it sparked my interest, and I soon discovered that the subject matter had others listening in on our conversation. And during the duration of this conversation, the Lord put it on my spirit that many believe a lot of what I'm hearing on my lunch break about the place hell. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for your word, for your word enlightens our understanding, Father. And I thank you for your word of God that it becomes alive within us. The rainbow of the word of God is very much alive and powerful and active in our lives. So, Father God, I pray, Lord, that you have your word anointed, 
I pray, Father God, that your word will go forth from this pulpit, not my words, but your words, Father God, through your written word, and through the Holy, Holy Spirit's anointing, Father, I pray that you bring it home to our hearts that we might live in your word each and every day. In Jesus we ask, amen. I sense that people in general do not have a problem with the reality of life and death. It's the reality of hell that they have a problem with. It's the reality of hell that people cannot grasp or understand about what this place is. And so the title of today's message is The Reality of Hell. And one person said, I cannot believe that if God loves us so much, and that he even sent his own son to die for us, then why would God send anybody to such a place if it even is real? Another said, if hell is real, I know too many people that's going with me, and I'm going to throw a huge party, and will never need to be sober again. At least of my co-workers. Yet another said, yeah, I know that's right. I mean, I'm heaven bound. I am definitely going to heaven. And you know what? Should I do something, or should I change my mind and live a life otherwise, then I know that I'm going to take a lot of people with me. And I know that hell don't want me anyway. So, you know why hell doesn't want me, he says? He says, because when I get there, I'm going to take over and I'm going to rule hell. Rather than joking, for people truly don't believe in hell, both is a very serious thought. Then they looked in my direction and they said, Sebastian, so what's the truth? Is there a real place called hell? And of course I said, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Because ultimately, every person must choose his own destination. Psalm chapter 9, verse 15 through 17 says that nations are sunk down in the pit that they made. I underline in my Bible, in the pit that they made. In the net which they hid in their own foot is taken. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executes. The wicked is what? Snared in the work of his own hands. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Throughout the years, I have heard some say that God cast the unsaved into hell. I don't know about you, but my Bible says that's not true. God does not cast the unsaved into hell. It was not and is not God's intention that anyone finds themselves in hell for all eternity. You see, if you look back to Psalm verses nine, or chapter 9, verse 15 through 17, it says that they may, that which they hid in their own foot is taken. That which they are snared in the work of whose hands? His own hands. So it's not God that cast you into hell. God in his infinite, infinite means never ending, God in his never ending love and compassion has expressed and has shown that he wants everyone to be saved and to know the whole truth. So I asked him a question. I'm asking you a question. Why would God, who is enjoying the splendor and riches of heaven, along with his only begotten son, want to send anyone, or even wants to send Jesus down to a sin-cursed world, who Jesus lived 33 to 36 years here, and then he was tortured and crucified. And if God truly is love, and God truly is the Father of this Son, Jesus Christ, why would God, you and me, our Creator, want to send anybody to a place described as hell? First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 through 6 reads, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So by our own choosing, listen, by our own choosing do we find ourselves in the destination of either heaven or hell. You're going to either accept the way, the truth, and the life, which is Jesus Christ, or you're going to reject the way, the truth, and life, and choose the opposite, the only other choice, hell. Can I hear an amen? How? How do we choose? I thought that's what God did. He chose for us. Many nations have turned their backs on God from the beginning of time. We see the same thing happening in our own lifetime. People of all nations continue to rebel against God's word, 
against God's commandments with each passing day. Many find fault and excuses for the rebellion, such as the church has let me down. My parents never took me to church. I don't know about this Jesus. The world never believed there is a God, so why should I? God never proved himself real to me. So therefore, how am I going to find myself in heaven? I don't believe in this God. Well, then, as I was telling them about rebellion, one asked, what is rebellion? Well, rebellion is an act of violent or open resistance. An act of resisting authority, resisting control, or resisting obedience to one in authority, which is Almighty God. So the truth is, we are the reason for this turning away from God. When we resist or choose not to obey his will and his commandments, which are for our safety and our preservation of life, then we are rebelling against God. So it's by your choosing to either be obedient to God's word or be in disobedience to God's word and find yourself lost without a savior. The Bible says what? For God so loved the world, I don't hear you, that he gave his that's whosoever should not but everlasting life. You see? We have a choosing to do. We choose to follow Jesus, choose to believe his truth, or we can reject. You know? We also find that the Lord is known for judgment, which means he executes or he carries out his judgment. God's word clearly tells us that hell is the final judgment. Although some deny hell is real, almost everyone believes in some type of life and death. The belief that there is life after death is most a reality. Given that a few people believe that their belief is that once we're dead, we're simply gone. That's it. There's nothing after death. But most of all, religious people, such as you and I, we continually to seek a peace of mind with the thought and belief that God is real. That God has a place for us to go after we leave this physical body. On the other hand, there are those who try to ease their thoughts and their pain of reminding themselves what happens after death by making jokes about hell, like we shared. One example that somebody gave me was one person said to the other, if heaven, or excuse me, if in heaven we don't meet, hand in hand, we'll bear the heat. And if it ever gets too hot, Pepsi Cola hits the spot. You know, it's funny, and people take it so lightly, but heaven and hell is a reality. It is real. And I'm sure you heard this one a time or two. You know I'm going to heaven because I did a hard time here on the earth. Right here. This is hell. You heard that? The existence of the Bible that calls hell is literally a real place. Listen, I heard Pastor T.D. Jakes once put it this way. Take any road and go to a beach on any part of the Atlantic Ocean and go down to the edge of that water. Then look across the horizon of that water. You cannot see England. But you know it's over there. You cannot see Spain, but you know it's over there. You cannot see Africa, but you know it's there as well. Now let's take the road to eternity. Look over the horizon of heaven. Heaven and hell is real as England, Spain, and Africa. You see, you believe in the Word of God, the Bible, right? You believe in the Bible? Huh? Yeah. So the Bible says of hell in Deuteronomy 32, 22, Moses said of it, for a hell is kindled in my anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell. In Job 26.6, Job says, Hell is naked before him, and destruction has no covering. In Psalm 9.17, David says, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. Solomon, a man that God called the wisest man on the whole earth, had said in Proverbs 27.20 that hell and destruction are never full. Isaiah said in Isaiah 5.14, Therefore hell has enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. And their glory, their multitude, and their pomp and death, all that he rejoices shall descend into it. Jesus spoke about hell more than anyone else in Scripture. And if you were to study the life of Jesus and what he said on this subject, you might be surprised that Jesus spoke of hell more often than he did of heaven. In Matthew chapter 5.22, Jesus said, Whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of what? Hellfire. And in Matthew 5, 29, Jesus said, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it far from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body shall be cast into hell. Listen, 
There are 600, or excuse me, there are 260 chapters written in the New Testament. And of those 260, 230 of those chapters substantiate, which means prove that there is a place called hell. It's real. Hell is a place of punishment, and it's an imprisonment that offers no parole and no release after time served. For hell is a paid place of eternity, a forever place of torment and suffering for all who reject God and his way of salvation through his son's sacrifice upon the cross and his amazing grace. The Bible describes the punishment of hell in many ways, but I found interesting was that it stands out to me most that it's a place of darkness. Peter says it's the mist of darkness. Jude says it's a chain of darkness and blackness, a darkness of darker than you know. Matthew says it's a place of outer darkness. You see, people don't usually like darkness, do we? I don't like to be in the dark, do you? I've been in Pittsburgh and in some neighborhoods in Pittsburgh, you can land a 747 plane there because that they have it split up so well that so many streets can be seen for miles away. People don't like to live in the dark. In Revelation 4.11, the Bible describes hell as a place of fatigue. Fatigue is exhaustion. In other words, the torment for a person in hell never ceases, and there's no rest for them. How would you like to come home from work and never get a minute's rest and start all over again, day after day, night after night, nonstop, just to get home, do your chores, and then turn around and do it all over again? Hell is like that. It never stops. You never have rest. You never have a day off. Revelation 9, 1 through 12 describes hell and says of it that it is as a bottomless pit. I can't do a roller coaster at ride anymore. <laughs> I mean, it's like my stomach is in my mouth and a ride is never stopping. Talk about a fast elevated ride. <laughs> That's what hell is described as. It is a bottomless pit. Listen, let me now tell you what, what hell is not. It's not that good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. That's not what it is. It is not a place where good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. What do you mean by that, Pastor Bob? Well, what I'm saying is to forget that nonsense. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what Jesus taught, and it's simply not true. If good people all go to heaven and all bad people go to hell, then we all will be going to hell. Hello? Because I don't know about your Bible. My Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 10 to 12, that we are all bad. The Bible says that there is none righteous, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Jesus tells us a parable in Luke chapter 12, or excuse me, chapter 16, verse 19 through 31, about a rich man and a man called Lazarus. Let me read it to you. There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and very sub 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 I can't even say that word, substantially, substantially, I'm going to say substantially, every day which means he really did well every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came, and he licked up the man's sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died, and he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died, and he was buried, and he was in hell. And he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and he saw Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried, and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And said, Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that when you in your lifetime received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between you and me, there is a great gulf mixed, so that they which would pass from here to there cannot go. Neither can they pass to us that would come from where you are. Then he said, I pray unto you, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. This is the man in hell. I pray unto you that you would send somebody to my house, for I have five brothers that may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, if one went unto them from the dead, they'll repent. And he said unto him, They hear not Moses nor the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. You see? 
Again, it proves in God's word that God is not the one that sends us to hell. It is our choosing what we're going to do in this life and who we're going to serve in this life is what sends us to hell. Amen? God said, if it were possible, I would have none lost, but all come to know Jesus and say it. Jesus spoke of that particular parable because he wanted to warn people like you and me of an existing place where sin is punished and God's anger is poured out. So if hell is not real, Jesus would not have warned us about it, would he? I ask God, why is it so easy for us to believe that heaven is real, but not easy for us to believe that hell is real? God answered me in my spirit. He said this, the idea of hell for a lot of people is offensive. It doesn't make sense to them that I am a loving God, but I have created such a horrible place like hell. God then said to me, people make the argument that eventually one day everyone, regardless of what they believe, will go to heaven. You see? And I heard that too at work. People believe because they are good. They give to the poor. They give to the church. They go to church every Sunday. They go to Bible study. They're a good person. And they find themselves in hell. Because they think they're good. Huh? What is the one main thing that keeps us from going to hell? Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Loving God is what keeps us from going to hell. You can love your religion. You can love your offering to the poor. You can love the idea of being a good person. I never killed anybody. I never lied. I never stole off anybody. My mom and dad raised me good. I'm a good person. And yet, if you never knew the loving God, if you never knew the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and you never had a real relationship with Him, guess what? You're good. All that you've done in life will not get you into heaven. Oh, it's quiet in you today. Can we see your amen? It's not my words. It's God's words. You see? Then God turned it around, and He asked me a question. What? Well, <laughs> How many of you, when you ask a question by God, you're like, oh no, this is going to be a toughie. <laughs> God said, would it be an act of love toward you if I took people who did not believe in me to heaven, who all their life believed in nothing or a false God who refused to love and serve me? Would it be an act of love toward you if I took people to heaven who refused to worship and obey me? who do not struggle and strive to live as my word commands? Would it be an act of love toward you if I took people to heaven who refused to believe in me before they died? I was like, whoa. According to Jesus, a person in hell has the ability to know the gospel, the Bible, the message of Jesus Christ. You see, just as we read in the parable of the Lazarus, the rich man, there is for all of us, before we die, an opportunity to accept Jesus or to reject him. You see, if only they had believed and repented of their sins, this rich man would be in heaven. They would not be in hell. Some really good people are in hell right now because they believe that they are basically good and therefore will go to heaven after they die. But the Bible says more than that. The Bible says in Isaiah 64, 6, but we are all as unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and all that we do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, our sins, like the wind, have taken us far away from God. So you better not be banking all the good you do will guarantee your ticket into heaven, because they won't. Although people believe that there really is a hell, See, there are people that do believe in hell. It was prepared for people like Hitler or Jeffrey Dahmer, but it was not for me. You see, there's people that believe in hell, but you have to do a certain evil to get there. You know, you have to be horrible like Jeffrey Dahmer or Hitler to find yourself in hell. You see, there's people like that. They have degrees of sin. Well, I, I'm not that much of a sinner. I, I might be this much, but I know people that are this much. You know, they have a measurement of what sin is. And God says, there is no measurement in sin. For if you have committed one, you're guilty as committing them all. Amen? So, hell was actually not prepared for the real bad sinners. Huh? 
That's what one question was. And I responded, hell was actually not even prepared for us at all. But for Satan, who rebelled against God, trying to become God himself. That's originally why Satan had hell invented. Why God created hell and had Satan found there. So why should we consider it a possibility that we find ourselves in hell if we don't repent? If we don't accept Christ and his atonement, his sacrificial payment for our sins, if hell wasn't even prepared for us, it was prepared for the devil. Because the day is fast approaching when we all answer to God for what we've done, how we acted, how we lived, and for how we treated one another. And all sin is damned into hell, just as Satan is damned for sin. Amen? God wants to hear this. God wants us to hear this and to know that hell is not for you and I. It's a real place, but it's not for you and I. Because he wants to, he, God doesn't want you to believe in hell because he wants to scare you. God doesn't want you to know that hell is real because he wants to scare you into obeying him. He wants us all to repent and live as he teaches us in the Bible, not because he's mad at you, but because he loves you. And he's telling you the truth about hell because the devil wants you to believe that it's not for you, that you're no way coming here, so don't worry about it. You see? The devil's a liar. God is telling you a truth that the devil and those who do not believe in him does not want you to know. And that is that God wants you to avoid hell, to repent of our sins, to trust in Jesus, for there's no salvation without faith in Jesus and the repentance of sin. Amen? Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus is the only way to God. We can't get to heaven by doing all kinds of good while we're alive. We can't even get to heaven because all of our lives we believe that we are basically good people. Again, Romans 3, 10 says, there is no one righteous, not even one. God's grace, his undeserved favor, his love for us that we don't deserve, cost us nothing. And yet, he says that he is coming again to gather those who believe in him and those who love him. He's coming to take us home into heaven and to live with him as his children forever and ever. In 1 Chronicles 28, 9, it says, For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and every thought. If you seek him, you, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. And in Matthew 10, 29 through 31, Jesus promises you and I that if we are all, that we are all valuable to him. And he will not and cannot cause us to die without his permission. You see? From scripture, we know that God will judge our hearts, and he knows that we have opportunity of which we have an invitation to accept him and call out to him to be our Lord and Savior. Each and every day you have a brand new opportunity to recommit your life unto God. God says, my mercies and my goodness and my love is renewed each morning. He says, if you have fallen, if you have slipped, then repent quickly. Cast that thing off and accept my grace, my undeserved favor towards you. Accept it and I will forgive you. You see, it costs you nothing. What it does say is that if you reject him, if you reject Jesus Christ, if you reject his love, if you reject his gift to you, salvation, if you accept or if you reject Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as not God, then you've already condemned, damned yourself because of your unbelief. You see, the only thing it costs you is do you dare to believe in the Bible, the word that God has left with you? The only thing it costs you is your choice. I mean, you're going to be with God, or are going to be separated from God for all eternity. From Scripture, we know that God will judge our hearts, and He knows, again, our opportunities at which we've had an invitation to accept Him. James 4 8 says, Come near to God, and He will come near to you. Hear this, people. God loves you, and He has a plan for your life, but He is not going to be man for your life. He's not going to come over and snatch you and say, listen, Beth, you're going to follow me whether you like it or not. <laughs> He's not going to say, Rom, you're either going to hell or you're going to stay on earth forever if you don't follow me. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, take up your cross daily and follow after me and unto righteousness you shall enter into the kingdom of glory with me forever and ever. That's what my Bible says. Take up your cross and follow me, you see. It's a surrender. It's a sacrifice. 
of your life unto God because he sacrificed his son for your life. You see, God loves you and he has a plan for your life. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that what? He gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And listen to the second part of verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. You see, God did not condemn you to hell. God has not chosen that you're going to hell. There is no division that the, that the left of the people are going to hell to the right of the people are going to hell. He didn't choose that. He said, for no one, I desire no one to enter into hell. I desire all to be saved. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be what? Saved through him. But here's the problem. John 10.10 10 says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. That means that God doesn't just want to, you to survive, but live a complete, full purpose of life. We all have done, thought, or said bad things. Amen? Ooh, I only heard one person agree. Amen? <laughs> I know y'all ain't good. <laughs> Neither am I. <laughs> All right? We all done, thought, and said bad things, which the Bible calls sin. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The result of that sin is death. There are two types of death. A death from the body, in which we live in, and a spiritual death. The spiritual death is eternal, permanent separation from God. Did you hear that? I said it again. The spiritual death is eternal, Permanent separation from God. That means you're never going to see life as you know it again. And you're never going to see the promise that God has for you in life. Because now you're eternally, forever and ever and ever, separated from God. I always, always, always pray. Even now, and, and, and it's not going to happen, it's no good now. But I was like, oh Lord, I sure hope my dad's not in hell. I sure hope my family members are not in hell. Oh God, I know that they do not know you like I know you, but I sure hope they're not in hell. That is a repetitive thought in my head. It's only natural, we're only here. We're, we're hoping for the good for those that we love. Amen? Amen? We have no way of knowing. At that last moment, they could have given their life up to God. God, I missed that. And I believe, I really believe this, that my Bible says that no one shall enter into death before they get the invitation to accept Christ. I believe that. That Jesus said, I would have none perish, but have everlasting life. So if he's going to have none perish, he's going to make himself known to you. And I just pray that those people that have not accepted Christ throughout their own life and on their death, deathbed, they recall something in their life that God gave them. That invitation, that one-time thought, that one-time word given by a brother or sister to them. That, oh, God, if you're real, please show yourself. I I'm sorry. Huh? God says heaven and hell is real. And if God says it's real, then we must believe it's real. If God described it through us as we read in these scriptures, then you know what it's about. You know what it is. We need to warn one another, as Jesus warned us and all of us, that hell is a real place. It's no joke. Huh? It's no joke. It's not a big party down there. You're not even going to see one another down there. The Bible says it's full of darkness, a bottomless pit, that you can't, there's gnashing and reaching out of teeth and torture and pain and suffering, and it never ends. There's no party. You're not going to recognize anyone down there. You're going to be in that bottomless pit floating downward like a roller coaster ride in an elevator, so fast, so hard that you feel that your stomach is in your mouth, and you're going to have things reaching out for you, gnashing at you with their sharp teeth, and, and the horror of hell is going to be real to you. It's not a party. The good news is, we don't have to die a spiritual death. Hello? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4 says, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. If you have ever known the closeness of death, and such as I did, when I took the suicide on the stair, I shared with you last week, I couldn't describe it. It was a feeling like I, I never had before. I couldn't put it in words. The closest I could put it in words is exactly what the scripture said. I felt like I was in a dark place. A heaviness was on me that I couldn't make. My mind was telling my body to get up, but my body wouldn't move. And I took so much drugs and alcohol that I thought I was hallucinating. And I couldn't get up from my couch for three days and three nights. I was that sick. 
I was vomiting on myself. I was defecating on myself. I was urinating on myself. I couldn't get up to save my life. And then that day, I didn't have a cell phone. It was on the wall. So I couldn't even reach the phone to yell for help when I repented of what I did. God, I don't want to die. But I don't want to live like this either. If you're real, prove yourself to me. And God reached out from heaven through Jesus Christ. And he raised me up, a dead man already, above the man, in a flash. He sent that this place called hell. And the reality of life and death hit me in the face. And I, listen church, I had to make a choice. You and I have to make a choice. You're either going to live for God, and you're going to love him, and you're going to trust him, and you're going to believe what he says in this Bible is truth. Or you're going to reject him and what he says is truth. And you're going to believe the lie that almost took my life. And God turned my life around to bring the good news to you and to educate you and to alert you, to warn you that heaven and, real is, heaven and hell is a real place. It's not a joke. It's not a party. It's for, set for Satan originally. But because we have followed Satan's ways and we've chosen to live opposite of what God says to live, we've chosen in ourselves to say, I don't want you, God. And you might say, well, I never said that. I never said I don't believe in God. I never said that I don't love God. I never said that I wouldn't go to church someday. I never said that I wouldn't say the repentance prayer someday. But I believe that I'll have a chance to make it right. How many of us can raise our hand and say, Somebody I love, somebody I knew, somebody is a good person. They gave me laughter. They were my friend, and they died. Within a couple of days, within a month, within a year of this past year. There's no promise that we have tomorrow. There's no promise that you don't step outside of this church and some drunk come down through the road and smack you and knock you over in those woods, and we got to drag your dead body up out of those woods today after church. There's no promise. You see, the world is filled with dangers and curses, and the world is set on loose on fire from the brims of hell to cause us to turn our ways up from God and follow after our own lusts, our own desires, our own ways. You see? Now, today is the day of salvation. You can choose heaven or hell. Today is the day you choose. Jeremiah says, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. I ask you today, as for you and your house, who will you serve? And people say, well, I don't so serve the devil. I, I don't worship the devil. I don't say seances. I don't even do tarot cards. And I don't read the signs of the skies. I don't do... It's not about that. See, that's his devices that get you tricked into following off of God, onto his ways, onto his ways of living. See, it's about, do I choose to love God? And if I love God, am I going to take up my cross and follow him? Don't no one go with me, yet I will follow. Huh? You know, I told you a little bit about me. My family, they, they, they didn't like me at first, right? Because I was doing bad things. I was stealing. I stole off my dad. I stole off my grandma to buy drugs. I was going out drinking, carrying on. They were totally against me, even though they did it themselves. They don't my bother do it. <laughs> you know? I was lost in sin, and they hated it because I just I hated them, and they hated me. I lost relationship with my family because I pulled away from them. Right? Because they judged me because I was not right. Then I got judged because now I'm too religious for them. Anybody ever had that? Oh, no, now they go to church. Well, now you're all, you do all that. Okay, wow. You, know, you keep that every day. You know? that, that's all right. We love you, but just don't preach to us. Huh? You know, it's natural. It's unshameful, but it's natural. Okay, I will. I will only share Jesus if you ask me something. Here. Yeah. Like, so I wouldn't talk about God. I wouldn't share Jesus with him. But in our means, we felt the distance. I'm afraid to get close to you because you might talk about Jesus. Or there's something about you. There's something different. And you just you make me uncomfortable. Hello? I don't have to say a word. I'm uncomfortable around you. You're different. I can feel it. I can sense it. Hello? Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Because if my words ain't going to help you, maybe the Spirit of God on the inside of me is going to help you. Huh? Maybe you see God. Maybe you hear God even without me saying anything. I pray, God, you do. Because I don't want you in hell. I don't want to know anybody in hell. I pray that this God that I serve reveals himself to you, and I don't care how he does it, just as he did it for me. I don't want you to be where I was on that couch. Listen, 
If you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I ask that you come to the altar and pray with me. If you have lost your way and you now aren't abundantly certain, absolutely sure, should you die today, tonight, tomorrow, that you find yourself at this altar, give me your life unto God. Please come. I want to pray with you. If you knew once that you were saved and you messed up and you turned your back on your faith and all lost is all hope is lost, you don't have that, that assurance that God loves me and that I'm going to heaven. Should I die this minute? I know I'm going to heaven. I know that I know that I know. If you're not sure that you don't know, then come to these altars on the pray with you. If you are sure and you do know God, then put someone in your mind that you know that don't know God and pray for them. Jesus, he said, I stand as an intermediator between my Father and you. And I pray for you. Oh, I sent my son, God says to you. I don't want you lost. I don't want you come to hell. I love you. You're my son. You're my daughter. I created you in my image after my likeness. Oh, I've done all that I can do for you. Now it's in your hands. Now you have the decision to make. Do you want to know my son? Do you want to know me? Do you want to come home to be with me as much as I want you to come home to be with me? God is speaking to your heart today. And if you're sure and you know that you're going to heaven and God is waiting for you, but you know family members, you know friends, you know loved ones that aren't so sure, that they themselves are asking this question, and maybe they don't even know how to ask, you pray for them. Put them in your heart. Put them in your mind. And you stand as intercessor as Jesus stands intercessory for us. Pray this prayer loud with me, will you? Dear God, I know that I am a sinner. I may ask you for forgiveness. I believe Jesus Christ is your son. I believe that he died for my sins. That he can raise them up from the grave. And that he is alive. I want to know this Jesus. I want to trust this Jesus as my Savior, and I want to follow him as my Lord. From this day forward, guide my life and help me to do your will. I thank you, God. I love you, and I pray this in your son's name, in Jesus Christ. Now pray for someone that you know that does not know Jesus as you know him. Dear God, I pray for my, and put the name in, my friend, my brother, my sister, my parents, my family. I ask you, forgive them as you have forgiven me. I ask God that you make Jesus Christ real to them. I believe that he died for not only my sins, but the sins of all people. I believe that you raised him up, not only for my sins, but for my family, my friends, and I believe that he is alive for them this month. I want them to trust Jesus as their Savior. I want them to follow him as their Lord. And God, I can't do it for them, but I can pray. I can stand in the gap for them, God. I pray, Lord, you touch my family and my friends. Make Jesus real to them like you have for me. I thank you. And I pray one day, They'll be sitting with me in church, not too far away, and be praising and thanking God as I am this day.